Welcome to Security Architecture Podcast, where we help cybersecurity professionals to stay ahead of the curve and ensure they are successful in their cybersecurity journey. Hi, I'm Evgeny. Hi, I'm Dimitri. We have here Gregory from Checkpoint. Gregory, can you please introduce yourself and tell us more about Checkpoint? Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Greg Pepper, and I'm a security architect with Checkpoint. I've been here a little over 13 over the 25 plus years that we've been in business. I was the inventors of the modern stateful inspection firewall, we're one of the leaders of the information security industry, but we're all going through massive change, and many of our customers are moving to more of a SaaS first mentality. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Checkpoint SaaS offering our secure cloud gateway. We call it Cloud Guard Connect. So, because we're talking about SASE, and uh, because you're talking about a bigger picture, can you tell what is the part of SASE offering Checkpoint is covering? Yeah, great question. There's a couple of different major parts that make up the SASE portfolio. Uh, what we're focusing today primarily is the firewall as a service, the secure gateway as a service, allowing you to interconnect branch offices, third party SD WAN solutions or even roaming users through a next-gen firewall in the cloud where companies can spin up the resources on demand in the regions they want without having to make the traditional capital investments and then the tunneling of traffic back to their physical data centers. There are other portions of SASE which include cloud access security brokers, DNS guards, remote access VPN as a solution. Uh, these are part of the Checkpoint Cloud Guard portfolio, uh, but tangential to what we'll be discussing today. Tell us a bit more about maturity. How long you guys been around with the product? Maybe how, like basically describe maturity of the product. Sure, great question. And we're technically on our second iteration of our cloud firewall. Our first generation capsule cloud, which was introduced about eight years ago, we built all the infrastructure in our own physical data centers. And though we had over 20 plus pops around the world, it was very costly and a slow moving process to continue to grow the cloud firewall as a service market. So our second generation is part of a unified infinity portal, which houses all of our software as a service products across endpoint, mobile, network, and cloud. And then Capsule Cloud, which we'll be discussing today, is our second generation that's a combination of our physical data centers for authentication and initial login uh, and provisioning as an example. But then the cloud gateways that consumers deploy on demand are spun up in a public cloud pod of their geographic region. So if I'm a customer on the West Coast, I may deploy my Cloud Guard gateways in the Northwest uh, within one of the regional cloud providers, or from a large multinational bank, I might have different pods in East Coast, Southeast, Central, and the Western United States. How do you license your product? Is it based on seats, devices, concurrent connections, bandwidth? How about bring your own device? Yeah, great question. Uh, the core licensing out of the box is a user count model. Uh, we do allow multiple user devices per user. So if a person has their laptop, their cell phone, their tablet device, it is a per user license model. Although we do have a few customers that have very large number of devices in the network without users tied to it. And we have come up with site and bandwidth specific pricing for those customers as yes, the default would be a per user cost. Uh, but for those you know, in healthcare and IoT and manufacturing, uh, they often have many more devices than they have users in the network and want to do more of a fixed bandwidth based cost as opposed to uh, you know, X number of users. Makes a lot of sense. You mentioned different pops. I think it's a good time to jump to architecture and maybe you can share your screen to describe more about Checkpoint Global Architecture for SASE and some of the nuances, how you guys operate from high availability, scalability. Yeah, so let me drop this slide on the screen. And so when I think about our Cloud Guard Connect solution, uh, customers would have first logged into our Infinity Portal, which think of that as a wrapper and container for all of our SaaS services. And then within that, they will then choose to provision Cloud Guard gateways within the regions of their choice. So done through API or done through a web-based wizards, users can deploy these next generation firewalls on demand and then set up the third party tunnels uh, to a native GRE or IPsec device. Uh, we also have vendor-specific integrations for many of the leading SD-WAN vendors. Roaming users are also able to be supported. 
in terms of proxy capabilities or lightweight agents or through some DNS security functionality if we're just wanting to filter out DNS lookups as opposed to having a ton of user traffic through one of these pods. You mentioned uh, the customer may choose where to provision the gateways. Is yes, that is correct. Everywhere, or is there a price for more gateways? Well, ultimately, the price is going to be tied per user. Although naturally, if you know they want the same number of users in four different regions, uh, that'll have a slightly increase in compute costs. Uh, but for us, we're consuming that on the back end, just based off of a simple user pricing model. Um, I don't think it's realistic for users to tunnel through all 20 geographic locations, unless we're talking about some of our largest multinational global customers. Uh, most of the customers that we're talking to are trying to bring up one or two gateways within the region close to their branches and their end users, allowing the least amount of latency and best user experience. And you mentioned 20 different locations. Is this right now checkpoint data centers or you guys are in public clouds like AWS or Azure? Yeah, so our CloudGuard Connect solution is a hybrid. Um, the initial authentication and centralized portal are running checkpoint data centers, and we have them in the Americas Theater, MIA, APAC as an example. And this is the primary portal where users will log into the checkpoint services catalog and be able to provision one of many software as a service solutions. Now, the CloudGuard Connect, once the gateways are instantiated, those gateways are deployed within a public cloud. Uh, they're privately managed by checkpoint customers don't have access to troubleshoot patch and upgrade we have full responsibility for that maintenance and operations but customers will choose the geographic region of which those cloud guard connect gateways are deployed can you mix and match if i have a checkpoint on-prem and uh, cloud guard connect of course that's one of the biggest strengths that we have we have over a hundred thousand customers globally running our enterprise portfolio and the cloud guard connect solution that we're describing can either one live entirely autonomously, fully web managed with no dependence on our on-premise management infrastructure. But for an existing checkpoint customer that has our hardware and software files on premise and want to manage the same policy, uh, they want to bring logging in as an example, they want to provide a common visibility for on or off network enforcement, customers can choose to manage CloudGuard Connect uh, directly from their on-premise management console if that's their desired outcome. In this case, I'm guessing we'll talk a bit later about roaming users. The roaming users will connect to on-prem gateway or to the cloud guard connect gateways, depend on their latency. You know, we have the ability to have our VPN auto connect to sites based upon DNS or performance or other round robin statistics, uh, or you can have manual precedence that says, hey, this group of users is always going to go to this set of gateways. You know, maybe my uh, finance, legal, all right, I want them coming back, but my roaming sales and marketing users, maybe they can go to CloudGuard Connect as an example. So how, how do you actually tie back to the user identity, uh, IDP, and uh, how you support uh, multi-factor authentication? Yeah, great question on that one. So we are going to integrate with a SAML single sign-on provider of choice. Uh, although some of our enterprise customers have an on-premise identity-based solution, uh, you know, a NAC identity type offering, radius accounting as an example. Those are some of the traditional on-premise integrations. In the cloud, we're going to integrate with things like Azure AD, SAML single sign-on, uh, and it doesn't matter to us if they use Ping, Okta, or some other third-party single sign-on solution, or if this is just a generic SAML federation. Uh, once we've identified users that allows an identity-based policy in the Cloud Guard Connect rule set, and it also then allows that single sign-on functionality to subsequent SaaS applications, which users might connect to after authenticating to CloudGuard Connect. What would be the best way to configure different job roles, right? For so example, the accountant needs access to specific systems in the company and the, the developer needs something else. How would you do that? Yeah, so there's two things. One are those resources internally or are those a SaaS resource as well? Because uh, the VPN backhaul functionality so I can connect to the CloudGuard Connect in the tower and then roam back to on-premise is something that may be required for an internal application. Uh, but many of our customers with this SaaS first mentality, even in the DevOps world, whether it's GitHub or other CICD tools, might just be consuming those as a software service. So we're gonna implement one, an identity-based rule set in the policy to whitelist certain groups to have access control to certain access and applications. Uh, but we can also tie certain content awareness and data types 
to those various access control rules. For example, I want to allow users to go to GitHub, but I don't want to allow certain data types or database schemas or password files or access keys to get uploaded to those file sharing sites. So you would look through the protocols and uh, you will stop connections and doing something that they're not supposed to do. That's correct. When we create our access control policies, it's a combination of user identity, application, URL, and data content type. So and we can allow DLP rules on that. Yes. So we have content awareness, which has over 700 predefined data types that users can implement into their access policies. For example, we may allow users to go to our box or Dropbox or G Suite as an example, uh, but I don't want certain types of files to get uploaded. So we have the ability to implement content awareness, the data type awareness on top of the access controls and application types we're discussing. And this analysis of this data, is, is it done on the endpoint or is it done in the cloud? This is done in the cloud. This would be a network-centric data loss prevention solution. Uh, Checkpoint as a whole does have a full endpoint suite with similar application control and URL filtering and data security and disk encryption and media encryption. Uh, but that will be tangential to the native agent for the Cloud Guard Connect only. How would you ensure that you can actually scale the cloud to customers' demand? I'm sure you experienced now uh, scaling uh, requirements uh, from the COVID-19 situation. Yes. Uh, if, you, if you can share with us a little bit about that. Well, the nice thing is we've been Checkpoint software since day one. And all of our out-of-the-box acceleration and deep packet inspection and clustering is built upon software. So these Cloud Guard Connect gateways that run in Amazon Azure Google, as an example, we can scale both vertically, moving up in instant size. So if I have 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 users, I might need to move from two to four to eight to 16 core gateways to do that level of content inspection. We can also scale horizontally through clustering multiple gateways together. So through dynamic routing and equal cost load sharing, uh, it is possible to have a thousand branch office potentially scale across different head and gateway devices. And since we're software out of the box, and granted Checkpoint has fancy hardware for the physical data center, but is an option, is not a requirement. So all of our protocol parsing, our SSL inspection, and our other acceleration technologies is built into the same exact software stack we run on premise. And then it lifts and shifts and moves with us to the cloud. And then based upon customer requirements and numbers of users, again, we can scale vertically to go bigger instances. And this would be transparent to the end users. Uh, there's nothing that they're going to need to do to go behind the scenes and upgrade the instances through our health and application monitoring, as well as naturally their consumption of licenses, we can scale the solution accordingly. So based on that, how do you make the user experience faster and better? Right, because you always have the traversal time between the client and the cloud. Of and course. it might be measured in the hundreds of milliseconds. Is there anything that you do to accelerate that? Well, a few things to point out. You know, one is that you know, we advertise less than 50 milliseconds latency. Now, yeah. naturally, that's dependent upon users and where they're located. Right? And they're over a round trip time to those cloud providers. But these are hairpinning in and out of these public cloud providers. So the outbound internet access is nearly exponential um, in terms of bandwidth that they're providing. So they're very low latency one to the internet, uh, but they're often peered themselves to major ISPs throughout the globe, allowing very fast internet handoff exchange to the likes of Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, you know, Time Warner Cable and others and so on. Um, again, equally, because we have that unique capabilities to scale up, if customers, for example, choose to turn on the SSL inspection, well, that's a computationally heavy uh, offering. But for us, we accelerate that with multi-core technology. And if customers turn on that SSL inspection functionality, which is really essential both from a threat prevention and an access control perspective, we're going to increase the size of the gateways, providing more CPU core resources to do that cryptography. One of the use cases to move to SASE-based configuration or architecture is the use of SaaS applications. One of them is, for example, Office 365. Especially yes. if you have a lot of different branches, you don't want to backhaul all the traffic, you want to go direct. Can you talk a bit more about what do you see from your customers or what you guys did to make sure you can accelerate such type of traffic? 
Yeah, so I think there's three things to really talk about in this. One is, do you want that SaaS application to completely bypass the tunneling to the cloud gateway? So for example, you may choose to whitelist, I'm just going to make it up, start on Microsoft.com or start at Dropbox.com if you did not want to route those potentially through CloudGuard Connect. Uh, the second thing to point out is we have an SSL bypass policy. So maybe you want to inspect untrusted sites, but maybe your Office 365 or G Suite is semi-trusted and you may choose not to do the SSL inspection on those particular traffic because you don't want to add the latency, which is especially important for apps like Zoom, Skype, Teams, and things that are a little bit more sensitive to packet loss and overall delay. Right? The last thing to then point out again is that performance metric and then if a customer chooses now to add SSL inspection, right, we're gonna increase the resources behind to try and maintain that end user experience. Now, some people choose to do the inspection on the endpoint as opposed to through the cloud. This way, the local workstation is doing the decryption and the policy-based enforcement. But that's a slightly different approach to managing laptop and desktop and mobile agents versus having a few software cloud gateways running as a SaaS. Thank you we started to talk about branch offices. So let's dive in a bit more and tell what's my options to connect from branch offices to your cloud and maybe divide it between if the customer has a checkpoint gear or the customer has not checkpoint gear. Yeah, so the process is going to be the same. Um, through the web portal, they're gonna define a site and that site is gonna have some type of a GRE or an IPsec setup. Now, when we do have specific SD-WAN vendors like Velo Cloud, Viptela, Silverpeak, Meraki, Aruba, and others, we will provide a vendor-specific configuration, which is the tunnel setup on the other end. Now, everything that I'm showing in these websites can also be done through an API. So if I was a very large hospital or branch office bank, as an example, and I had a thousand sites, well, nobody wants to click next a thousand times in a website. So everything that we're showing in here has a common API so that all this provision can be done through a programmatic JSON interface as opposed to having to point and click. Now this is just for the provisioning of the site to bring those tunnels up into those Cloud Guard Connect instances. Definitely can save time uh, for big, big companies. Now I'm wondering, if, I'm guessing if you're doing Checkpoint Firewall to Checkpoint Cloud, you will support automatic tunnel uh, active backup. What would you do with uh, different devices or with, with SDVM providers that you mentioned? Yeah, so regardless of checkpoint and checkpoint or third party, there's going to be two tunnels for every device set up, right? So multiple gateways are deployed in the cloud and these branch offices are going to have tunnel one and tunnel two, which can be used for failover within a particular site. And then if necessary, right, it can be configured for a site to site failover. So if I lost my US East pop in both gateways, now I want everything to fail over to the US West as an example. Okay, and it will be done automatically or for the supported devices? Well, part of that depends on whether or not it's just configured with static routing or dynamic routing, right? With checkpoint to checkpoint, we have our multiple entry points. So we have native tunnel test failover mechanisms. Uh, and then depending upon the interoperable device to detect the failover, you know, it's responsible for sending traffic to gateway one or gateway two because it's really just an outbound tunnel. It's not a bi-directional tunnel. The solution we're talking about right now is primarily from an egress perspective, although the data center back call is kind of the next evolution and maybe a separate part of that conversation. What about any limitation on bandwidth with GRE or IPsec? How do you guys uh, deal with uh, like five gig or two gig to, uh, yeah, traffic from a question. From now remember, in the public cloud, every instance has rate limiters around it. And it's not an Amazon or Azure or Google specific thing. But in addition to the CPU and the RAM and the disk, there's various levels of network IO that each cloud instance is capable of achieving. So based upon, you know, two, four, eight, 16 core images in the public cloud, you might get one, two, four, or up to 10 gig worth of virtual network throughput. So that is where for us, we can never go faster than the speed limits and the policers put around us. But since we're software and we can scale vertically on much larger instances and have things like enhanced network drivers for the public cloud, allowing those 10 gig VNIX. And then with the multi-core acceleration, we have the ability to scale vertically as performance is necessary. And I guess if needed, you can have multiple GRE tunnel or IPsec tunnels. 
Yeah, we can bring them multiple head ends, right? So if, let me just say, we're talking to a commercial credit union, they had a hundred branches versus a large multinational bank with thousands of branches. Well, if I have thousands of branches, I might need a couple of hub sites. I don't know if routing a thousand branch offices of a bank is gonna be most effective through one gateway. We might have a couple head end gateways to distribute that load horizontally, as well as maybe provide for some tunnel failover mechanisms. Let's switch talking about roaming users. And as Dimitri mentioned, this is where we are right now. We all work from home pretty much. So tell us a bit more about my options as an end user to connect to the cloud. Yeah, so we have three primary mechanisms which roaming workforces can work with CloudGuard Connect. Uh, the first is purely from a DNS perspective, where all of the DNS queries are mapped to our, the, our DNS service, and we're providing whitelisting and blacklisting on those DNS lookups. Uh, the second is- Gregory, just cut you off for a second. Is the, do I deploy an agent, I'm guessing? Uh, this will be an agent less. We'll get to the agent full oh, option. Okay. This is just through managing the DNS settings. So you might push it out with group policy or some other software configuration. Or if I have a, a mobile device management solution, I might be provisioning a profile on an iPad or an Android device. Uh, but step one is just from a DNS settings. Uh, option two is from a proxy configuration. So in the same way we use group policy or other system tools to lock the devices into using these proxies in the cloud, uh, that would be the second agent-less way for this to work. Uh, the third option is when we actually have a small agent or software stack living on desktops, laptops, and mobile devices, and that is then responsible for configuring, or I should say establishing those IPsec tunnels and SSL tunnels into the cloud. So DNS-based, proxy-based, or agent full base where it's a full tunnel to the cloud instance. Great. I'm guessing with the agent less makes sense. I have to somehow make the configuration. For the agent, we hear a lot of talk about if I have an agent, I can disable the agent, for example, or remove the agent. How do you guys overcome the problem? Well, it, it varies based upon devices and the other software controls that you have on it. Um, you know, this device is a consumer device and I have full root access, especially inside a checkpoint. We bring our own mobile devices. I own my phone, the company owns the plan. But if I have a mobile device management or some other software stack on it, it's possible to provision the profile in such a way that it cannot be removed. Now on laptops and desktops, again, depending upon you know, group policies or other tools from a software distribution perspective, right? we can lock down some of those configurations and which settings users are able to or not able to define itself. Um, I will say that Android and or Apple do have some enterprise security controls built in that can be provisioned as necessary. And those tools which lock down customization of certain settings would enforce the DNS, the proxy, and or the application that was rolled out. Especially when we're working with mobile device management solutions, they can do a cooperative enforcement as an example, that if we, or if the agent was removed, it might block access to email or other resources until that software stack was restored. So you, you bring an interesting point. What if I remove my antivirus, or I'm not fully patched on my laptop? Can the agent do host checker and decide, oh, you're not fully compliant, you will not get access today, or you're gonna have limited access? You know, our full endpoint agent has the compliance blade built into it, which allows you to run those various software checks. Um, the lightweight agent for CloudGuard Connect is really designed more of a tunnel endpoint and doesn't have the full capabilities of compliance and posture checking. Is this something customer asking for? Yes and no. Uh, to be honest, uh, posture checking of managed known devices is very easy to do. Posture checking of unknown and unmanaged and bring your own devices is a lot more complicated. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't check for a number of antiviruses right, that have signatures that are not older than X number of days. Um, but there's so many different antiviruses and antivirus engines, and if all of a sudden now we're trying to remediate BYOD devices, most enterprises' IT staffs are barely equipped to support their enterprise-managed devices, let alone their unmanaged BYOD devices that have every flavor of hardware and software known to mankind. And so based on that, it sounds like uh, the, the straightforward control that's been used is uh, by proxy, uh, overriding the proxy settings uh, known to the operating system and the, or the DNS uh, settings. So how about uh, you know, 
different other protocols or other applications doing communications or over protocols like UDP or uh, applications that communicating directly over IP addresses? Yeah, great question. So for that, we will need the full tunnel in order to encapsulate any port and any protocol and apps application. You know, the ease of use with the DNS and the proxy is that it's very lightweight and fast. And especially when we're talking to existing enterprise customers that have some of these controls in place, it's very simple to migrate from vendor A to vendor B. But to gain full visibility for non-80443, eighty and UDP53 traffic, we need that full tunnel endpoint, which then allows us to see you know, thick client applications, any port and protocol, in addition actually to all the web traffic that's being proxied through the device. So the light agent is tunneling all the ports and protocols? Yes, it is. It is. It's tunneling all the ports and protocols. It just doesn't have the full capabilities of our endpoint suite, which has the posture checking and the disk encryption and the EDR forensic functionality, as well as you know, media encryption and port protection and other enterprise managed controls that the full suite has versus the roaming agent, which is really just designed from an authentication and a tunneling mechanism. Great. Next question in mind is, is there any other way to consume Checkpoint Cloud Guard Connect? Maybe by OEM, who is the ISP, or any other ways that you guys done it with someone else? You know, we have talked to numerous, um, both SIs, managed services partners, and telcos, although they are not currently in their line cards from a product offering just yet. Um, we have many partners that have managed SD-WAN services, which can implement and integrate with such a solution. Thinking domestically, two of our larger at and Verizon have a managed SD-WAN uh, that can work in conjunction with CloudGuard Connect. We also have the, the sister product, which is CloudGuard Edge, which would be the virtual firewall that runs on the universal CPE equipment. But that's for customers who want to take the content inspection and bring it to the branch office itself, either for intra-site security, maybe east to west between sites, or they want additional uh, you know, local switching so I don't have to tunnel to the towers in the cloud as an example. Since we're talking about outbound browsing, we have to talk about secure web gateway components. So what we did, we took Gardner definition of what need to be in secure web gateway component. And we're going to ask you some questions about how you guys address such components. And we'll start from URL filtering and categorization. How do you guys address URL filtering from categories perspective? What are the options and what, the, what are the capabilities? Yeah, so we have one common URL database, an application control database that's consumed, uh, whether it's going to be a cloud service such as CloudGuard Connect or the on-premise solution. Uh, we call it Threat Cloud, which is a combination of both uh, threat indicator sharing, app and URL database, and distribution. You know, out of the box, we have over 160 predefined categories. We have over 8,000 different applications predefined, and over 250,000 social media widgets that can be customized if you want to allow uh, Facebook, as an example, to block chatting or video, as an example. So the Threat Cloud, which is providing real-time updates for either on-premise or cloud gateways will provide reputation updates, category updates. It'll help to classify unknown or uncategorized URLs, as well as providing updates for our antivirus and anti-bot to block access to the main and control or other sites that are known to be malicious in nature. How, how, how are you actually protecting uh, against well-known domains? Right? How you, you block known URLs that are, you know, becoming malicious dynamic because we all know that recently there's a lot of attacks that originating from trusted and well-known domains. Of course. And this is where we're bringing both our threat prevention and their access control policies with us. You know, every one of our customers is highly unique when it comes to access control, identity applications, and data types. From a threat prevention, most of our customers are exactly the same. Keep the bad stuff out so people can do their job. So one of the blades that runs is Antibot, which is a pre-Rule Zero inspection. So any outbound traffic that potentially matches sites that are known from a command and control, reputation, block listing perspective, those are going to be dynamically looked up in real time and enforced prior to the access rule base. So let's just say that some new site potentially had an ad server that was compromised and those portions of the content are now deemed malicious. 
while the anti-bot blade that's running on the Cloud Guard Connect is going to real-time correspondence with Threat Cloud and be able to block just the malicious server traffic, allowing the legitimate user traffic to traverse through, but potentially in this case blocking the ads or the content that's being served up by the server or servers whose reputation is dropped. I'm, I'm more concerned, uh, you know, from uh, information being exchanged with services such as uh, Gmail or uh, G Suite or G Drive or any of these, because yes. these are highly been leveraged for attacks recently. And this one, you know, these uh, domains, you, you cannot actually drop the reputation a lot because they commonly use them. So how, how would it work in such such case? Yeah, no, that's a great point, right? You really can't just block all of Google and Microsoft. Uh, well, you can, but you have a lot of unhappy people and a lot exactly. of kids, right? So this is where we might attach certain content awareness to those types of applications. Or as an example, an enterprise may only have an authorized Microsoft Enterprise file sharing, and they want to block personal file sharing. So there's ways for us to lock down access to some of those enterprise SaaS and storage applications to just have connectivity to the authorized subscriptions and the accounts and not uploading data types to a personal or unauthorized subscription. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. And you talked a little bit about protecting from malicious files during download, right? So you, you're actually yes. analyzing every single file being downloaded. Are we taking it through a sandbox uh, process uh, for that? Yeah, or? so we have a product we call Checkpoint Sandblast. And this for us is a combination of our file emulation where active content as is downloaded can get sent to the cloud for detonation and analysis. Now it's important to note, one of the things about our sandbox that's different than others is that we have both an operating system and a CPU hardware level of emulation. One of our acquisitions a few years ago was a company called Hyperwise that had patented technology that we've integrated into our sandbox that allows us to listen and monitor the calls at the Intel, at the x86 layer itself. So it's not just that we're listening inside the windows with this office and this Adobe and this patch suite. We're also listening to the hardware instructions. It doesn't matter what the operating system is, but it's all the same x86 instruction set. So we listen both at the hardware and the software, which increases both their accuracy, speed, and time of detection. We can also do what we refer to as threat extraction, which is active scrubbing of content. And in that particular case, as an example, if you submit a resume to Checkpoint, we actively scrub all content out of the resumes and CVs. This way we're delivering a clean, sanitized file to human resources. And if the original file is needed because the macros or VB scripts were legitimate, those users can check it out of a quarantine, much like an anti-spam type solution. Makes sense. So content... Uh... Uh, analysis and uh, disarm is uh, part of it of this uh, services suite. That is correct. Right, and this is the same enterprise solution that our customers are deploying on premise, and is now integrated with CloudGuard Connect. Uh, side note: that same level of scanning and sandboxing can also be run at our endpoint agent, or even plugins for Chrome browsers, Safari browsers, uh, Chromebooks, Macs, iPads, etc. You mentioned G Drive, Dropbox, and similar. So, Dimitri, did I cut you off? You're finishing something? Okay. Um, what will be the use case and the reporting and the visibility you will see where people are, of course, browsing outside and they're probably using hundreds of different applications and not of the, all of them are sanctioned? So, the shadow IT, uh, shadow IT problem. What checkpoint will present to the customer? How does it help them to mitigate the problem? So let me answer that in one of a few ways, because naturally we're going to log all of the user specific traffic and we have integrated reporting and logging and dashboards built into the solution as a whole. And that being the case uh, those customers who are, you know, checkpoint enterprise users, they want to go ahead and bring that data back to their on-premise management as an example. Others who have a third party SIM, let me sh uh, switch my share for a minute. Right, they potentially want to have this information wind up in Splunk, Logarithm, ArcSight, Q1, Sumo Logic, or something else. So all of the forensic data by default is going to be stored in your CloudGuard Connect subscription within the Infinity Portal. But if we needed to get the logs out, as an example, we can do so. I mean, all of the raw log data is built into here, as in the CloudGuard Connect Portal. But all of the specific user traffic, if we needed to, 
again, we can send this out to any third party SIM, you know, through native syslog integration or, you know, more vendor specific. And I guess I can create reports as well to show me all my SAS or not SAS applications. That's exactly right. So uh, users can customize their reports and generate their own filters and views. Uh, but also a lot of the information that we're showing within here, all of this could be scheduled to generate these reports on a periodic basis and have them uh, emailed to IT or, you know, departmental heads as an example. For example, we've got a couple of our public sector customers where every department head every week gets a report of the web usage of all their employees as an example. You mentioned Teams and uh, other applications that potentially need a lot of uh, good bandwidth and, and, and uh, small latency. What's the options to bandwidth control with the, with the solution? Well, in the full enterprise solution, we have uh, both uh, QoS functionality as well as application bandwidth shaping. Uh, so it's possible to shape bandwidth at the application layer, uh, saying, hey, I don't want to have YouTube use up all of my pipe. Uh, but remember, these gateways are running in public cloud where they are multi 10 gig, 40 gig, and 100 gig connected. And not to say that we don't have some ability to do bandwidth shaping, uh, but bandwidth shaping for this solution is less of a concern because of the bandwidth that the public cloud providers offer us, as opposed to the on-premise solution where maybe I have a you know a hundred meg internet link and I'm sharing it for all of my users. Okay, so by design you're just not doing this right now, or there's no customer demand. Uh, there's less customer demand for this solution because they're not paying for the bandwidth. Right, there are bandwidth costs incurred but that's part of our cost on the back end, which you know ultimately the customer pays through that per user subscription model. But if they all of a sudden have a you know, increase in traffic, uh, they're not gonna have an increase in bill because people are online more one day. Okay. Let's talk about DLP. So you mentioned you guys do content inspection. I know DLP is a very, very big topic and, and very lengthy topic, but if you can describe it in a minute or two what you guys do in inline DLP, it will help. Yeah, so I mentioned that we have numerous uh, pre-identified data types, right? So if these were social security or HIPAA or personal records, as an example, users can specify attaching some of these content types to a specific access rule. So for example, we were talking about the Dropbox or the G Drive, right? Maybe I want to prevent access keys, RSA keys, PGP keys, and other potential sensitive information from getting uploaded. So we can attach those data types to a destination, which could be a category or a website or an application. And then that source, again, this can get tied to a particular location, although I might have user identity enabled. So this source might be an Active Directory user group as opposed to uh, an IP range or a branch office location. Based upon, we're gonna allow or block based upon content and application and identity specific uh, attributes. This access policy that I'm showing on the screen right here, for an existing Checkpoint customer, they can use our Enterprise Management Console to upload the policy into the cloud itself. Uh, for those who are using this independently and autonomously, naturally they might just use the web interface and or I alluded to an API, which can also be used behind the scenes to provision the rules much in the same way. So they can easily extend whatever they use in their office without reconfiguring it from scratch to the SASE offering of yours. That's correct, that's correct. So again, those checkpoint users that have on-premise management, uh, we will enable it. And this way, the management server that's on-premise, as an example, just as we install policy to our physical gateways, we would install policy to our virtual gateways. Uh, unfortunately, I'm in a shared demo account and I'm not in a read-write permission to make that change right now. But users, once they've enabled the centralized management, can send the, the policies out and then we talked a little bit about logs, right? Whether or not and how we get those logs out of the systems as well. So we have the ability to have a, a log export functionality that can be turned on. If customers say, hey, I love the logging information, but I want to get it somewhere else as well. So this brings us to a very interesting question. How can the customer a POC or solution, you know, how easy it is? What's the process? If you can share it with us, it would be great. Yeah, it's super easy. So one, customers can go to portal.checkpoint.com. That is Checkpoint's overall um, SaaS offering. And in there, you're gonna find our Cloud Guard Connect solution. You would also find our endpoint, mobile, and other platforms that are out there as well. Customers can register for a free trial. And out of the box, they can get a 30-day free trial 
uh, without any need for Checkpoint or our partners and resellers to be involved. Now that being the case, once they log in, they have the option to deploy any of our SaaS offerings. So CloudGuard SaaS would be our CASB. Right? We talked briefly how that's part of the SASE portfolio. Uh, this solution we're talking about is CloudGuard Connect. And for those who maybe want the full endpoint, rather than managing it through a cloud SaaS, but as an endpoint solution, right? we have our ability to run our Sandblast agent, which is either for browser plugins only, or even for full endpoint management. Lastly, we've introduced our Checkpoint Smart Cloud, which is our traditional enterprise management portfolio, but delivered as a software as a service as well. So for those people who maybe had the legacy Checkpoint solution, and they don't want to have to do in-place upgrades and management and monitoring, but still want that central management, Smart One Cloud would allow them to have the full enterprise smart console, but done through a web browser and done through a cloud managed service. You mentioned a lot of technologies have been developed inside Checkpoint and used by Checkpoint. Do you guys right now have any technical partnership with other vendors where you comp uh, complement each other? Yeah, I mean, there's three and four main areas where it comes to mind. You know, clearly in the cloud, right, we enhance the native security controls of Amazon, Azure, Google, Oracle Cloud, Ali Cloud. If you bring your own next gen firewall and our CloudGuard IS products, as well as our ability to have native posture management and workload protection. SD-WAN is another area of key integration for us. And there's a multitude of vendors that we've done third party integrations with. Similarly in the data center with people like VMware, Cisco, Nutanix, the ability to have virtual instances. Lastly, we put a lot of effort recently into our IoT ecosystem, allowing us not just to work with Cisco ICE and Aruba ClearPass and the traditional laptop desktop NAC solutions, but there's a variety of vendors out there like RMS, Medigate, CyberMDX, Order, and others that have IoT controllers that allow dynamic profiling of devices on the campus. And much like we talked about identity integrations for users with SAML single sign-on, these IoT integrations allow us, us to consume their third-party device information, program a lot of the access and threat rules that we've been talking about, and have a very tight zero-day, zero-trust implementation with those IoT vendors. The last question in the series uh, is around uh, reporting and uh, metrics. Uh, what is interesting here to understand, uh, you know, how I can actually visualize or see in a report what was the status before I start using your technology and what is the status after? And if there is any uh, bullets that, you know, I can, I would be able to take as a season to the board and present that's the, you know, that's the ROI. That's what we got from the product. Yeah, I mean, the whole before and after is challenging, especially if, let me say it differently. If we are the before solution from an on-premise, it's very easy for us to collect performance statistics, user traffic profiling, and help come up with the baseline and understand what is the change of total cost of ownership in moving to such a solution. Now, for customers that have third-party solutions, there are ways for Checkpoint to passively analyze the traffic, complementing their current solution to help baseline the policy, the bandwidth, the number of users as an example. We refer to this as a checkup where Checkpoint solutions can be deployed physically or virtually to help analyze and baseline that traffic and then help us prepare for successful migration rather than having to go inline, you know, open things wide up and then try and lock them down afterwards. Now, from a TCO perspective, part of this is the collaboration with our customers and partners to help truly understand, you know, what were the hard costs for software subscription support and maintenance, but also what are the potential cost savings in terms of FTE and or time? Because collectively, the people, the time, and the money is where that cost savings can be found. Uh, we came to free chat time, and anything else you would like to tell us about Checkpoint? You described a lot of interesting things that I didn't know changed from my days in Checkpoint. Yeah, I mean, for better or for worse, we've been around for 25 plus years selling firewalls and too many people think we only make firewalls. Uh, that's like saying Cisco only sells routers and switches as an example. But we have a very robust security portfolio that includes a full endpoint security suite with EDR and disk encryption that supports both Mac, PC, Chromebooks, Android and iOS solutions. We have a suite of mobile security solutions you know, that integrates with CloudGuard Connect, mobile threat prevention, as well as native VPN solutions built in. 
Clearly, the network security has always been our bread and butter. But one of the things that we've continued to learn over time is giving customers flexibility. Flexibility in hardware, flexibility in software, flexibility in programmatically configuring the solution and not always being dependent upon our traditional Windows-based console. And then lastly, in the cloud, every one of our customers is rapidly moving to SaaS, platform as a service, function as a service, and traditional IaaS as a service. And Checkpoint has pivoted very quickly, both to enable us to lift and shift our core enterprise product and integrate it with Amazon auto scale groups or Azure VM scale sets or Google multi-instance groups, right? We've taken the traditional enterprise portfolio and put a cloud wrapper around it to make it programmatic, elastic, automated in its deployment. But with our acquisitions over the last few years with both Domain and Protego, we've really expanded that cloud portfolio to include security posture management, governance and compliance, cloud native configuration management, cloud native threat hunting, cloud native support for things like serverless and Lambda functions as an example and containers. And yes, we still have the option to bring our firewall with us, but in today's DevOps world, well, it's not always possible to put a firewall in front of your Lambda function or your RDS database. And Checkpoint has forked in the road to not just allow us to bring our core product, which is still highly relevant, but have native cloud security controls that are built in that allow you to keep up with the speed of DevOps and shift left in that security mantra and not just have scanning after things are deployed and the network can see it, but allow us to scan into CI CD tools, looking inside of Terraform templates or cloud formation templates or other Jenkins tools as an example, or even container scanning, just as one of our newer security capabilities. And though we continue to develop and make the best enterprise next gen firewalls in the market, it's a portion of what Checkpoint does. It is not everything in what we do. And our infinity strategy, you'll see it with the portal.checkpoint.com, gives customers that choice of a next generation cloud native platform that's built in the cloud and for the cloud. But the key here that this is an enhancement and augmentation of our enterprise portfolio that over 100,000 customers globally have been running for the last few decades. Thank you. What's your personal take on TLS 1.3 and how it will change the market? Oof. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not an SSL specialist, so I don't want to comment on the differences. All I know is that it is constantly changing. It is a cat and mouse game for us to always keep up with. And especially now that some of the sites are doing things like SSL pinning, we've had to enhance our SSL capabilities, integrating with SNI support. And it's one of those things that we're constantly having to evolve and enhance our products. The nice thing is, again, none of our SSL inspection is dependent upon hardware and ASICs to do any of the offload. So it's very easy for us to be agile in terms of software development, bring forth new capabilities, and either run those capabilities in your own IaaS environment, run it in your on-premise, or run it in the cloud. Now, that's not to say that SSL hardware acceleration is a bad thing. We have some options for that. But when you move to a SaaS or you move to a public cloud, you don't get to bring your Cavium chips with us. So you have to have a more software-centric strategy for SSL, deep packet inspection, protocol parsing, threat detection. Because when we move and drop these resources in the cloud, I don't get to bring my own ASICs with me. Interesting. So you guys support DNS security and also, of course, full-blown outbound browsing. Is the DNS security as a SaaS option was asked by customers or you guys decided it's a easy, low-level option, just like a first level of defense? I think it was threefold. I think one, there were solutions in the industry that had some type of a DNS guard. And it was important for us to be able to complement uh, the native tunneling of traffic with a lightweight solution that one customers want. And two, I think is a value to the industry. Uh, the other thing, it's not just DNS, right? We've had a lot of content inspection around email, right? Spear phishing and other attempts are really the primary way in which malware is getting into an organization. So not just being the network security company, but having true application understanding, right? So we put both for email, for web, for DNS, and other critical protocols, enhancements to the core product, as well as dedicated point products to help address those solutions. Yeah, and by having this DNS capability, it will give you some advantage when it comes to DOH and uh, having all the world moving to encrypted DNS traffic. Of course, of course. And look, I mean, 
who puts in an IP address anymore, right? I mean, I, I can't even remember a phone number because it's in my phone these days. Everyone's just using FQDNs and URLs, right? So that being the case, the DNS lookup is the first part of any of those HTTP or SMTP flows. And if you can poison the DNS, well, you can poison the clients, right? So we have to be able to do that first level of scanning and sanitization at the DNS level and then complement that with additional HTTP and HTTPS inspections as well as the additional application controls, threat mitigation, and content awareness capabilities. Awesome. Gregory, thank you. Any questions to us? This was a lot of fun, gentlemen. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and your audience and hope that we have the opportunity to do this again as you move beyond firewall as a service and look at other SASE components or even other technology that you've learned about that Checkpoint has to offer. We appreciate your audience's time and looking forward to our next session. Thank you. Gregory, last question. If people in the audience wants to learn more about Checkpoint and POC the solution, we know it is gold, portalcheckpoint.com. Any other links, any other ideas? Sure. I mean, naturally, people can go to checkpoint.com and find the individual product pages. I mentioned portal.checkpoint.com is our SaaS offering where all the solutions that we talked about can be found. And then naturally, we're on social. So if you want to follow us on LinkedIn, you want to follow us on Twitter, you want to follow the company on Facebook as an example. There's a wealth of information and constant updates that are being shared on our social media channels. Uh, I'm real easy to find as well if anybody wants to reach out directly to me. Again, my name was Greg Pepper, and I can be reached directly at gpepper at checkpoint.com. G-P-E-P-P-E-R at checkpoint.com. Thank you. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and join us for our next episode.